Colonel White, well, welcome to the brand. Colonel White, well, welcome to the brand new edition of To The Point. I'm Priti Mishra. And on today's show, we are joined by Secretary of Water and Sanitation, Government of India, Mr. Padeshwaran Ayer. Mr. Ayer, Welcome to Bhar Television and thank you so much for joining us. You are heading one of a very important empowered groups that has been constituted by Government of India and Prime Minister to facilitate supply chain in the wake of coronavirus pandemic. What is the strategy, Mr. Ayer? Sure. So, you know, this group, as you mentioned, is focused on trying to remove some of the bottlenecks which arose particularly in the beginning when the pandemic broke. And uh, so there was a bit of a disruption in the beginning when the lockdown was enforced, uh, that was understandable because uh, the idea was to isolate people and keep them out of the streets. So our group, uh, which consists of representatives from all the major ministries dealing with logistics and supply chain, all the way from the transport ministries, railways, ports, railway shipping, uh, airlines, etc., uh, all the way down to food processing, consumer affairs, and food itself. We also have representatives from pharma, so the idea here was that how can we come together as a group and work to assist the home ministry, the health ministry and other related ministries in making sure that products related to essential items uh, go from point A to B. And we're talking about all the way from production, which includes distribution, manufacturing, packaging, ancillary units, all the way down to wholesale, retail, and to make sure that households get food and essential items in the most convenient manner. So that's the broad mandate. And what we typically do is we try to fo focus on four areas. The first is we try to unbundle some of the policy and implementation challenges. For example, uh, the movement of trucks uh, you know, in the beginning because of the lockdown declined. And there were a number of reasons for that, apart from you know, drivers not being available, the fear of corona, but also because of the requirement of e-passes at different levels. So uh, we recommended to the Home Ministry that you, the driver should only show his license. That should be enough and take a cleaner along with him. And the Home Ministry accepted that. And that communication was passed on to the states. And that helped a little bit in the movement of trucks. Then it came to workers for industry, for uh, transport, for unloading. Uh, all the workers were in lockdown, so they needed passes necessarily. So how do we uh, make sure that the requisite number of workers in the essential industries were facilitated by local administration. Uh, then the issue came about of you know giving some kind of safety net to the drivers. So we're working on some kind of ex gratia package if that's necessary, food packets for drivers, and then looking at different issues for different stakeholders. So we've been working on this for the last uh, 15, 20 days. And uh, have these bottlenecks uh, been removed to a greater extent given the movement of trucks across the country? There's been significant improvement over the last, in, increasingly steadily over the last three weeks. Uh, we, uh, in the progress report, you can see now that the trucks carrying food and pharma products are about 60 plus percent. Uh, the mandis are, you know, about 50 to 60 percent open. Uh, tomato, onions, potatoes top, uh, you know, is reaching. There's some fluctuations here and there. We also do a lot of troubleshooting. For example, there was a problem of unloading of rakes in the northeast. The onion market in Nashik, uh, you know, suddenly uh, went into disruption because a person was diagnosed as COVID positive. So we worked with the government of Maharashtra. We made sure that the trucks moved out. We are now make, trying to make sure that food supplies, particularly to the urban poor, uh, need to continue. You know, a large number of voluntary agencies have put in a phenomenal effort. More than one crore cooked meals are being delivered every single day. And so we want to make sure that the state government support these NGOs. We work almost on a daily basis with all states. We do Zoom conferences with the resident commissioners. Uh, we engage with stakeholders. And you know there have been some phenomenal success stories by individual departments. The airlines are running Lifeline Udan. They're carrying medicines to different parts of the country. The Air Force is carrying medicines and food to far-flung areas. Railways have gone above and beyond the call of duty. The Postal Service is doing a phenomenal job the ports are getting unlocked and there have been great initiatives at the local level. So Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation 
is running a program called Vegetable on Wheels, where they're home delivering food. And uh, we are now trying to make sure that the vulnerable, the elderly and the disabled, you know, food and essential services are delivered to their households. So basically, we are doing everything from firefighting on big problems to trying to unbundle uh, some implementational bottlenecks. We work in very close coordination with the Home Ministry, with the Health Ministry, with the other empowered groups. So it's all hands on deck effort. And uh, so far, I think we're making good progress, although challenges remain. Mr. Ayer, there was a very legit suggestion made by uh, Prime Minister of India wherein he said that there is a need to incentivize direct marketing of farm produce in order to avoid the crowding of mandis. What is happening at that point? So, uh, again, on this, there are a lot of parallel efforts. A lot of the mandis have developed uh, standard operating procedures which lead to safe, hygienic, and healthy activities and to avoid congestion, right? To avoid. And so social distancing, there's a good practice being done in Vashi, which is one of the major mandis in Maharashtra. And even in Azadpur, the Delhi administration is working now to develop SOPs to make sure that they can run the thing, uh, you know, uh, they can run the mandi, which is one of the largest receivers of vegetables and fruits, but also on a safe basis to make sure that social distancing is still possible in a fairly congested area of Delhi. So I think it's becoming uh, also important for the e-commerce uh, companies uh, to deliver, to collect and to deliver. So I think it's on both fronts to make the mandi safe as far as possible in these circumstances to make sure that the social distancing takes place, but also to go in for direct delivery to buy from farmers and to deliver to the end point as well. Absolutely. We're talking about the supply chain here and you talked about the e-commerce companies. Large retailers as well as e-commerce companies do have urgent companies to expand the basket. What is your answer? Look, I think the Home Ministry uh, letter, you know, there have been three uh, letters in particular which have, have, you know, made sure that the supply chain moves ahead and makes it efficient. April 3rd, April 12th, and the most recent yesterday, which is a comprehensive letter and, you know, advisory by the Home Ministry to the state governments for the post 14th April lockdown situation and beyond. So in this, they made it very clear a, first of all, e-commerce can operate, and also they have repeatedly made it clear that you know the state governments have the full flexibility to decide what is essential and what is non-essential. Because sometimes there can be a bit of nitpicking, you know, what is essential, what is not essential. So the flexibility has been given to the state governments to decide, and I don't think there's any specific issue uh, on this regard. So basically, trucks are allowed to carry both essential, non-essential, and uh, the e-commerce companies as well. Now, definitionally, there may be some issues here and there, but uh, the Home Ministry has made it very clear that the interpretation will be with the implementing state government. Absolutely, sir. The delivery has to be ensured by the state governments. But how difficult is it to evolve a comprehensive or a cohesive strategy across states with varied demands? Look, it's, uh, you know, I think everyone is working on this at the moment. I mean, the key priority, of course, is to ensure that the lockdown is effective. And clearly, you know, uh, if there are containment zones, uh, the state governments and the cities need to work around them. The effort to maintain the supply chain is happening at all levels, at the national level, at the state level, at the district level, and in fact, right down to the local level. So our job is to make sure there's smooth coordination between these different actors and wherever an issue erupts. So it's a combination of trying to be proactive to anticipate problems and also to respond to all the stakeholders, whether they're the public sector or the private sector. So we are on call for most of the time. We meet every day uh, at 12.30 as a group uh, where we discuss the issues of the day. We uh, try to resolve issues. We work bilaterally after that meeting. So we are very much on call for most of the day and in fact the night. And our job is to make sure, is not just to give advice, but to actually troubleshoot as well, to contact the state governments, to unlock difficult situations. And so ultimately, we are in, a, in the troubleshooting business, if you like, of making sure that the logistics and supply chain of essential items remains as un, un, uninterrupted as possible. Absolutely, sir. You've mentioned about railways and you've also mentioned about airlines. First, let's talk about uh, railways. Uh, we understand that railways have these parcel vans for supplying essential items. Do we see the expansion of network? Look, it's an excellent initiative by the railways. 
and where they are very happy, to, you know, and it's particularly useful for states which are trying to, you know, to send through fresh fruits and vegetables. And so this parcel service which they've started, they're very happy to expand it. And one of the things we have been able to do is to connect them with state governments. So as I mentioned, we do a regular video conference with the, with the resident commissioners of state governments to understand their requirements. And then the railway as well as the airlines respond. So the airlines are doing exactly this. Where are the demands coming in from? And how do they aggregate the demand? And then in the most efficient manner, deliver the essential goods. So railways, absolutely, the parcel is going to expand. And not only that, the railways has very kindly offered to expand uh, the number of cooked meals. You know, currently they provide about two and a half lakh cooked meals through the ICRTC, you know, the, the, the railways which runs this, uh, this catering service. And now they're planning to expand that further if there is a demand. And so this will particularly help, uh, you know, districts and towns which potentially are falling short of being able to provide cooked meals and ration to the poor. So the railways again is stepping up to the plate. But how do you work on the logistics of supplying this cooked meal to the people who need it? Yeah, so this is where the outstanding network of NGOs and voluntary agencies across the country, they have really stepped up to the plate. And so this other group, which is uh, the Empowered Group led by Mr. Amitabh Kant is working with the NGOs. So we do this inter-group coordination. So most recently, we held a video conference with all the principal secretaries of food and civil supplies and principals of urban development with the resident commissioners, where we tried to find out whether the, the, the supply chain is basically through these NGO, for the most part. Many district administrations are doing it either directly or through the local NGOs. Every district is supposed to appoint one nodal officer to deal with NGOs. And they can be, if either they get funds on their own to private agencies or they can use the SDRF fund for providing food and shelter. So this is a phenomenal task which is going on at the moment. As I mentioned, more than one crore cooked meals are being provided every single day. Now this needs to be sustained over the remaining lockdown period. So we are working with the state governments and the NGO network to make sure that they can sustain this phenomenal effort which has been going on for the last three weeks. And how do you view the role of Lifeline Quran? I, look, they have, uh, you know, they're running what they call a hub and spoke model. So they run, get to these regional centers and there, you know, it can be shipped through, through road. But the, the entire airline industry hats off to them, you know, to the civil aviation ministry, but also to the Indian Air Force. And Lifeline Odan is both international as, you know, bringing in medicines from other countries and other medical equipment. But within India, at short notice, they have been able to mobilize and I think literally the term lifeline or done speaks for itself. Absolutely, sir. But what are the technological interventions that you're looking at or you're working with to ensure continuous supply of essential items? Right. Now, you know, a couple of things are going on here. One is the e-pass, right? And to make sure that wherever pass is required at the state level, that it's done, you don't need to carry a piece of paper. And so right now this, this app the, the, the Arogya Setu app. The idea is that this app, which everyone needs to download, you know, as the Honorable Prime Minister mentioned, it's a very useful app. But the idea is to also use this as an e-pass going forward so that it will have value and you can use the same app in case you need to show your pass to a police person. So I think technology is being used there and we are coordinating with MITI on that, the Ministry of Elect Information Technology. In addition to that, we are running a portal in this empowered group housed in my ministry, where the resident commissioners, all the state governments have access to it. So they can post their information on it. What are their demands? Other states can respond. So if there's a, someone is supplying mangoes from Telangana, then the receiving state, whether it's Punjab or UP, knows when the consignment is coming. Also, we are sharing good practices and all these excellent lessons which are going on, which states need to learn from. Uh, so that portal is active. Uh, the state governments have access to it. The other ministries have access to it. Plus, uh, many of you know many of the ministries are also running. The consumer affairs is running a helpline for the stakeholders. So I think that the use of technology in uh, promoting the supply chain management and logistics is very much on. Suppose uh, April 20th, we are looking at greater economic activity to strike a balance between lives and livelihoods. 
but one of the major concerns of uh, the companies of the manufacturing units is that of the laborers. How would we address that? Exactly. So now, uh, you know, a couple of things have taken place. I think the Home Ministry has, has allowed a lot of flexibility here. And, you know, so for example, in the industrial sector, if you look at ports, you look at airports, you look at railways, these authorities are now uh, authorized to give names of the essential workers to the local authorities so that passes can be issued. The situation of getting workers to load and unload has improved dramatically over the last 10 days. Initially, there were issues, people were in lockdown or they were afraid to come out. Now they're being encouraged, in, they're being incentivized to come out. And of course, now a major focus will be the agricultural season, yes. right, where the rabi crop is being harvested. So FCI has come up, stepped up to the plate. Uh, offtake is taking place. Pradhan Mantri, Garib Kalyan Yojana, the food grains, five kilos of wheat, five kilos of rice, one, uh, one kilo of, of pulses through NAFED. All that is being activated. I have never seen such coordinated action uh, by the government and working closely with the private sector before, frankly. I think it's been a phenomenal team effort across the board. Absolutely, sir. Team effort is required to, find this, uh, to fight this pandemic. But pandemics and economics both don't mix. You said several challenges. What are the challenges and the way ahead, sir? Yeah, look, I think... You know, obviously there needs to be a balance between, you know, what people are calling lives and livelihoods and uh, people need to get back to work, but only if it is safe. So I think the government is very clear that health and safety comes first and uh, that needs to be balanced with livelihood, but livelihoods are also almost equally important. So after the 20th, as the Home Ministry guidelines have made clear, uh, rural areas in particular are being opened up. Uh, certain industrial clusters are also being opened up. I think uh, everything is very clear that nothing is at the cost of health. So if there are containment zones or there are issues, obviously that will take priority. But I think after the 20th of April, you're going to see a, a, an increase in economic activity, an increase in agricultural activity. Workers are going to come out. Everything, of course, needs to be done by social distancing, maintaining the health criteria which have been put out by Ministry of Health. But we are confident that there will be an increase in economic activity uh, after the 20th of April. And going forward, I think uh, the new normal will be how do you practice all these activities, whether it's infrastructure or sanitation or just general industrial growth in the context of COVID-19. And what are those practices which will need to be enforced, whether it's wearing a mask or using sanitizer or keeping a safe distance from anyone else. These protocols are being worked out by almost all sectors. And I think they will be enforced and people will get used to them and we'll get back to a kind of new normal. Absolutely, sir. And before I wrap up, I'd like to touch upon two important aspects. One, of course, is about the hotspots. Any specific strategy for the hotspots? Look, I think that, you know, these strategies are being developed. Obviously, uh, you know, the idea is to contain, uh, to isolate, to keep people inside. So that process will go on. And our job is to make sure that we work within those parameters. And I think this, you will see these being rolled out uh, after the 20th of April. And lastly, sir, what about the rural areas? Sure. And that's precisely what I was saying. Uh, you can see in the circular issued by the Home Ministry yesterday, the 15th of April, uh, after the 20th of April, rural areas, if you, see, if you see the instructions, outside municipal limits, most economic activities are, are allowed. Right, because in urban areas you have more densely populated situations. So outside that, so for example, Manrega is, is coming back, uh, water and sanitation, irrigation, water conservation, a number of activities which will sort of kickstart the rural economy are being allowed. Needless to say, we have to be very careful to make sure that it's all done within the health conditions. But uh, I think post 20th April in rural India, with the agricultural season coming up, uh, Manrega is starting again. I think you're going to see this thing getting kick-started. Absolutely, Mr. Ayer. A big takeaway for me uh, from this interview was the new normal that you talked about, wherein we also have to focus on lives and livelihoods. And of course, we have to see what happens post the 20th. On that note, thank you so much for joining us and all that for all your endeavors. Thank you.